Thank you, Ingrid, for that introduction. Uh, so Jennifer said that she felt old. I will let you know that this is the 30th anniversary of my attending the doctoral consortium. So I am honored to be able to speak to you after so many years of sitting where you sat and now being here. Um, as Ingrid said, I've spent a large portion of my career uh, in government agencies serving as an economist. And today I thought what I would do is give you something of a background in capital formation and some regulatory changes that have occurred recently. This is based on a paper that I have written for Columbia University, who's taking a new look at um, a, com a special study that was commissioned in 1963. So in 1963, the SEC commissioned a study to look at a broad range of issues within the securities markets. Uh, these, uh, this study is extremely interesting. It's 7,000 pages long. I mean, it's huge. Uh, and Columbia has undertaken an initiative to reproduce that study and had commissioned a number of papers uh, to give a baseline for what is happening in financial markets today. There was a lawyer and then there was an economist, and so the, I was the economist for the primary markets. Uh, this is going to be mainly equity focused, but I'm going to echo what Jennifer said that, you know, we more capital formation, as you'll see here, it comes in the debt markets than it does in the equity markets. And so understanding debt markets more fully is important to understanding capital formation. Uh, but much, again, uh, is the light under the lamppost. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit today about um, equity markets instead. So when you read this study in 1963, in the chapter that I have, you know, which was 279 pages long or some such thing, um, I was limited to 50 pages, so I had to do quite the job where they had much more room. But some of the issues that they raise are so completely uh, relevant to today. It is almost uh, very, it's only you could be reading any paper in any journal uh, by looking at what are some of the issues in 1963. So they were, they were worried about hot issue markets and, and, and bubbles in assets. Uh, being issued. They were concerned about unregistered securities, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And particularly, they're going to look at conflicts between underwriters and issuers, and I want to bring up some areas of research that's going to be very important uh, after January, uh, so that'll be uh, something else we can discuss. So, uh, there are other concerns, however, that prevail today that may not have prevailed then. Uh, there's been a prolonged decline in the number of firms that are going public. Uh, there's also an increase in the information availability. I don't have this slide in here, but Apple's IPO was roughly, I don't know, 50 pages, uh, and Snapchat was 300. So why do we have so much more disclosure today than we did in the past? Is that helping investors? Is that not helping investors? So that's an area we're not quite sure what this additional disclosure is doing. The commission has on, had on its table for many, many, many years uh, an initiative to rethink about the disclosure requirements for firms, but because of things like the financial crisis and Dodd-Frank have not been able to get to that initiative in any, any uh, meaningful way. Uh, and so the research that we do can help inform, I think, uh, regulators to decide what type of disclosure is relevant to decision making and what type of disclosure may not. And I'm going to give you some look at that in a moment. Um, other things that are, are uh, going to be very important for the talk today is this blurring between public and private markets. Uh, private capital has increased a great deal and many companies are able to get private equity and debt without having to go to the public marketplace. Uh, which means alternative forms of financing, mainly through regulatory uh, changes that have occurred recently. And we don't know a lot about what's going on in, these, in, the, in the capital formation process, both at, say, an initial public offering and a follow-on, not a seasoned equity offering, they're called follow-ons. Uh, follow-on offerings um, is because we don't have allocation uh, data. So I'll come back to that in a moment. So I'm going to assume that most of you have heard about initial public offerings. Most of them are book built, where an underwriter gets information from institutional investors. It's the dominant form of, of uh, uh, offering method around the world and, of course, in the US. Uh, the main uh, 
feature of book building is that it allows underwriters discretionary allocation. So this is kind of a big deal. So underwriters can give shares to whomever they want to. They don't have to give them in any sort of uh, um, even-handed or fair way across other types of investors. And we do know that on average, initial public offerings are underpriced. So a lot of the research that you've read, I'm sure, in your classes has discussed why those things are uh, underpriced. So the offer price is less than the aftermarket trading price. So that's sort of the first day returns. This is from Jay Ritter, who, who compiles data on IPOs every year. So if you're interested, his website is a wealth of information. As you can see, you know, there's the dot-com bubble. You see the high initial returns there. But you also see that it, it's pretty uniform across the sample. Initial returns are on average around 14% per year. And so the question is, why do issuers leave so much money on the table when they could get more capital in the initial public offering? Well, if you read the 1963 study and you look at what's happening today, it has to be the case that the benefits of underpricing must outweigh the costs, right? So there are, must be benefits to both underwriters and to issuers. So what are some of the benefits of underpricing that make this a long-term issue? Because if you read the 63 study, they talk a lot about the fact that these issues are uh, underpriced in the market and how unfair that is. So, of course, the big one is that initial returns can be used as currency. The underwriter can give to favorite clients highly underpriced shares, which is a form of a kickback in some sense. But it's not just issuers that care about that. So there's a thing called friends and family program in which managers or owners of the firm can invite friends and family to participate in the offering, and that in turn can be used as a form of currency. Uh, there is, a, we have a lit, litig, litigious the society, right? So we have litigation risk here, and that's a, also a, a risk of overvaluation. If I don't know why Snapchat is in such high demand, if I price it up to the equilibrium price, that may not be the price in the long run. And as an underwriter in Mishmore, I might be sued if that valuation falls down. Uh, prestige and rec recognition. So when you read the Open the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, you don't read about the IPO that's sort of flat on the first day. You read about these huge initial returns. You get to see the company CEO ring the bell. It's very exciting, right? So this big pop on the first day is somewhat like free advertising. Uh, if you're an insider, you thought you were gonna sell your shares at $10, book building says you're gonna sell, sell it at 12, you're really happy because you just now became a whole lot richer. So what do you care if it goes to 16 because you're not selling in the IPO? You're gonna sell later. So now you're even richer than you thought you were before. So what do you care if you're leaving some money on the table, if you yourself are very, very, going to be very wealthy? And then uh, others argue that you might get something by allowing underwriters to underprice, such as analysts following. But I want to talk to you about conflicts of interest because there's some interesting things happening in the EU that might uh, allow for some natural experimentation in the benefits of uh, limiting underpricing, I mean, uh, conflicts of interest. So. Uh, book building is beneficial if, if repeat customers can reveal truthfully information about an offering that is beneficial to the issuer by increasing the amount of proceeds that are raised. However, as we know, there can be conflicts of interest between the underwriter and the uh, uh, issuer because the underwriter wants to use underpriced shares as currency, right? So, uh, and an interesting initiative that's occurring now is MidBid2. I don't know if any of you are aware of it, but in the US we allow soft dollars, which is the bundling of trading commissions and research uh, by brokerage houses. Uh, in January of 2018, MidBid2 is going to unbundle commission dollars, uh, trading and research, and they're not going to be allowed anymore. Now this has caused a great deal of concern here in the US, mainly because uh, global firms are going to have to ring fence somehow their European operations to comply with MIFID II because obviously in the U.S. soft dollars uh, do in fact uh, uh, are allowed. Um, and so I think that there may be some research opportunity here to look at you know, the same firm looking at their operations in one 
uh, in Europe versus their operations in the U.S. to see what is the impact of soft dollars. The problem with soft dollars is, is that most firms don't know how much is going to execution costs and how much is going to research. Uh, and so there have been a lot of initiatives to try to figure that out among the industry participants. But I think it may be uh, a very interesting way to look at the, the soft dollars and what happens to things like allocation and IPOs. Um, also, it's not clear, cl clear to me that there is an allocation <laughs> strategy you could come up with that would not give the appearance of a quid pro quo. If I have lots of information, I'm a good client, what are you going to do? I'm going to make sure that I give you some preferential treatment because you're giving me good information. But if you have a lot of trading commissions with me, that looks like a quid pro quo. So I would be interested, maybe one of you will be clever enough to come up with an allocation strategy that can get the benefits of book building without the appearance of a quid pro quo. Uh, so the decline in number of IPOs, if you've not been living under a rock, have probably heard about this ad nauseum. The new chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Jay Clayton, has made it a priority to address this particular issue. And it's not just the number of IPOs that have declined, it's also the number of public companies have also declined uh, over the time period. Uh, there's a paper by Ronnie McCauley that looks at uh, the fact that industries are becoming more concentrated uh, as well. And so there's a huge shift in the economy in the US with, in, uh, with respect to public companies. So what are some of the reasons for the decline in IPOs? Uh, well, there's been a lot of increase in regulation. Again, I told you that the average prospectus, a snap test prospectus was 300 pages, so there's a lot of compliance. Others have argued that the trading ecosystems for smaller companies have become unsupportive, so you have things like Reg FD, which requires you to give information to everyone. Uh, there was a global analyst research settlement, which took away some ability of analysts to follow your company. Reg NMS, which maybe Ingrid could talk a little bit about, but uh, requires that you go for the best bid and offer, which means our markets have become slightly more fragmented, and it's not clear that, uh, and, and allow HFT, which may disadvantage smaller traders. Uh, there's also been a change in the competitive landscape that goes along with this consolidation in the industry. You sort of need to be very, very large in order to be competitive, and so smaller companies are now being sold rather than going public. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about things like private sources of capital and alternative exits rather than uh, focusing on this. The trading ecosystem right now, if you're interested in market microstructure, the SEC has a tick size pilot study going on, which I'm sure a lot of people uh, are looking at that data to see whether or not tick sizes um, are, are, can be used. I, I'm skeptical about that claim, but uh, it would be interesting to see. So here are some, I don't know if you can see this, alternate sources of capital, but you can see that it's increasing quite a bit, and most of this, as Jennifer pointed out, is coming from the private capital side. So it used to be that if you wanted to get large amounts of capital, you would have to access the public markets. Today, you don't need to do so. You can stay private a lot longer, and, you can, and so we have a large number of companies, unicorns, as I'm sure you know they are called, uh, which have a market valuation of a billion dollars or more because they've been able to access private capital. Uber is obviously a big one uh, that, that everyone knows. Uh, you can also see here in the um, gray is the number of M&A transactions and IPOs is in the um, gold. So M&A has always been a very popular exit vehicle for uh, young firms, but now you can see that it's become the most prevalent one. Uh, in particular, you have to be careful when you look at M&A exits because very good companies are sold in M&A, but also very bad companies are too, particularly when venture capitalists have to roll over a them. So uh, there's quite a heterogeneity in the types of companies that access the M&A market, but you can see the prevalence of having more M&A activity uh, instead of IPO exits. So as you know, the Jobs Act was passed in 2012 to try to try to uh, do something about the IPO market. Um, it's supposed to reduce the regulatory burden of firms that go public, uh, but actually what it ended up doing, I think, is to actually increase the ability of firms to stay private for longer. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the IPO provisions, but they, they increase the number of uh, 
beneficial or rec holders of record that a firm needed to have to go public. So it used to be if you had 500 shareholders of record, you had to file documents with the SEC. So most firms engaged in an initial public offering at that time. So that's how come um, Facebook, Facebook and uh, Microsoft went public is because they hit that shareholder of record threshold. And now it's 2,000, I think, uh, shareholders of record that you need to be, which can take a long time, because a shareholder of record is not a beneficial owner. It is, if you hold your name, in, you hold your security and street name, that's a shareholder of record. So there can be millions of shareholders behind any shareholder of record. So Jobs Act is a rare instance of deregulation. There are very few of them, securities offering reform. Uh, smaller reporting companies or others, but most of the time we have more regulation than less, uh, and those would be the things that occurred uh, in the top and the bottom is deregulation. Uh, so what do we know with this deregulation? So one of the big benefits of the JOBS Act for IPOs is you can confidentially file your registration statement with the SEC. You can test the waters before you go public so you can find out what demand looks like there's reduced disclosure at the time of the IPO offering, and you have reduced compliance costs like with SOX and say on pay after you are a public company. The initial evidence suggests that the Jobs Act has not been all that great at increasing the number of companies that go public. So there's some initial evidence that the number of biotech firms increased uh, right after the Jobs Act, but that has since declined uh, in the near term. Uh, in addition, underpricing appears to have gone up after the Jobs Act, maybe indicating that the disclosure requirements may be inappropriate for these larger companies. You can have up to a billion dollars in revenue and be determined and be called an emerging growth company where you can take advantage of these um, uh, provisions. Um, and so uh, there's no evidence that direct costs of going public have declined. So it's unclear what the benefits of the Jobs Act have. I have a paper that looks at some of those benefits, but they're very hard to quantify, as many benefits are. And so it's not uh, a sure thing that the Jobs Act has been very effective, indicating that it's not the regulatory burdens of going public per se that, that, that are keeping young companies from going. So the question that has to be asked is, what is the market failure here? Do we know what the appropriate number of public companies might be? Do we have a market failure? Does it matter whether companies remain private in the US? Is it going to be through the asset management side? Is it, is it because young companies need to be public so that we can understand the role of these firms in our economy? It isn't clear. So we need more research to understand you know, why we need firms to be public. What are the, the economic reasons for that, right? So job growth is always the one that's given for the Jobs Act. It's called the Jobs Act, for heaven's sakes. Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act. It's a lovely um, uh, title. And so, but job growth doesn't appear to be all that related to IPS. So there's some evidence that that helps a little bit, but it doesn't appear to be a huge factor. So. You know, when you're thinking about research topics, understanding the benefits of public companies and why we need public companies is important. So there's also been changes in the Job Act on unregistered offerings. So unregistered offerings are exemptions from the securities laws that allow you to privately place securities. So Reg, Reg D is the big exemption. Reg D offerings, I'll give you some statistics on that, are used by venture capitalists for their limited partners. It's used by companies, so a lot of different uh, entities use Reg, Reg D offerings. They have some uh, limitations on who you can sell to. Uh, regulation A plus, so Reg, Reg A was supposed to be used for small offerings, but nobody used it because they had to go through what we call uh, blue sky laws, which is state security regulators have to uh, approve any offering that's not registered on a national market system or a national exchange, like the NASDAQ or the NYSE, there are many of them today. Uh, and so they got that exemption. So Reg A is supposed to be sort of an IPO light. You have lower disclosure offerings, you have some, some uh, ongoing disclosure is also supposed to be lower. Still hasn't had much take up yet, but it's still early. Uh, Bill Hambrick, who used to do, and still does, auction IPOs is now engaging in Reg A offerings. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not um, exchanges will take up the mantle on Reg A. And then, of course, crowdfunding. So all of these are brand new exemptions 
Uh, Reg, a is, uh, Reg D is general solicitation, meaning you can advertise to get investors. Uh, but certainly Reg A and crowdfunding are two areas of, of research, very nascent, but as you go in your career might be interesting areas to explore to see whether the economic benefits are there for those two types. So here's capital raised by type of offering, and you can see that, first of all, registered debt uh, is and uh, is about the same size as, as Reg D. Reg D, most of these securities are debt, they're not equity, but there are some. Uh, and the amount of private capital raised in the United States in some years exceeds the amount of public data. And you know, we spend a lot of time on registered equity. So many papers look at registered equity, but as you can see, it's the amount of capital raised in the United States is quite small. <laughs> In fact, most firms do not, uh, most firms never raise a second round of, of public equity, all right? Or only raise one more round of public equity after going public. Right? So I hope today that you've gotten a feel sort of some regulatory changes that have occurred in the landscape for capital formation. I think this is a, a new and great area of research for people to engage in because we don't know a lot about sort of this new landscape and what it means. Uh, as data becomes more available on private uh, equity and private debt, I think um, finding out what are the benefits and costs of those would also be useful. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them about the regulatory environment, but I also want to encourage everybody to do two things. One is to think about working at a federal agency for a year on leave. Um, it is a great way to learn institutional details. You'd be surprised at how much regulation is the friction and how much it can matter in your research, so make sure you understand the institutional details. And second, submit to the SEC conference. We have an SEC conference every single year, and we have a call for papers out, so I hope you'll submit to that. Thank you.